Hello, Johnny from Dicebreaker here. As you may have already seen on the channel, this week I played Elder Scrolls Call to Arms, the Skyrim-based miniatures game from Modiphius Entertainment. It's not the first time Modiphius has crossed paths with Bethesda, of course, there is, naturally, Fallout Wasteland Warfare to consider. Rather than a nuclear wasteland, however, Call to Arms is set firmly in the land of Skyrim, and it does a pretty great job of riffing on the source material. So much so, in fact, that I made this, Seven Ways Elder Scrolls Call to Arms Stays True to Skyrim. Apologies, I don't have any footage of Call to Arms in action, or indeed any footage of my face. Here's some lovely Skyrim footage to keep your eyes busy in between the still images. Anyway, first up is Stealth. Any Skyrim player worth their salt will know sneaking is a core part of the Elder Scrolls experience, allowing you to circumvent your enemies, gather loot from the shadows, or set up a devastating sneak attack. The same is absolutely true in Elder Scrolls Call to Arms. If one of your characters manages to break line of sight with all enemy models, they can use an action to hide. While there is always a chance you'll be spotted if a roll goes against you, it's generally a pretty safe bet if you need to reposition and don't fancy soaking up an attack or two along the way. During my playtime, for example, I got my Dragonborn to hide and then sneak past a waiting Draugr to open up a treasure chest and swipe the goods inside thereby fulfilling an objective I'd set myself in the form of an oath at the start of the game, more on those later, earning myself a victory point and, crucially, avoiding an attack. Hiding isn't without its drawbacks, of course, moving stealthily can be a tricky business, and that is reflected in the character's movement stats. While hidden, characters are unable to sprint, limiting their movement range to their base movement stat, which is 6 inches for the vast majority of models. Some characters, however, are skilled in the art of sneaking, as denoted by the sneaky snake icon you can see on the Dragonborn's character card just here. These characters are able to get a wiggle on while moving stealthily about the place, meaning they can spend a point of stamina to increase their movement and travel a little bit further. As someone who relied on being sneaky, a lot while playing Skyrim, it was nice to see that element of specialisation retained for the miniatures game, making the Dragonborn into a person with a particular set of skills, rather than just an all-round tough nut. That, and it's also just really satisfying to sneak up on an enemy and then womp it from behind for a big chunk of damage. Satisfying as it might be to sneak up ever so slowly on the enemy, however, sometimes you just need to sprint across a room and do an enormously overpowered attack on a weak and hapless minion, which is where we find the next way in which Call of Arms stays true to Skyrim, namely Magicka and Stamina Management. As I briefly alluded to earlier, each character in Call to Arms has a stock of Stamina and Magicka points. Magicka, as you might expect, is used to power and boost your spells, while Stamina is used for sprinting and also powering up attacks. These abilities are extremely useful and the game definitely encourages you to make liberal use of them. Characters automatically regain a point of Stamina and Magicka every turn, with certain items like potions and trinkets allowing you to recover points a bit faster. More on items in a bit. As much as the game encourages you to make use of your stamina and magicka, however, it's easy to overspend and find yourself unable to move those extra three inches or guarantee that extra bit of damage when you need it most. As well as keeping you from feeling completely overpowered, that risk-reward approach to exerting yourself feels very familiar, very Skyrim. Surviving a tough fight in Skyrim is a delicate balancing act between your stamina and magicka pulls as well as the items you have equipped. I'm sure every single Skyrim player has, at one point or another, had to pause mid-fight and devour a few wheels of cheese or glug a potion just in order to swing their sword one more time. Now, Call of Arms is of course turn-based rather than real-time, but nonetheless it does an impressive job of recreating the same sense of balance between exertion, exhaustion and effectiveness. Now, I mentioned items a moment ago and, somewhat unsurprisingly, this is the most straightforward way in which Elder Scrolls Call to Arms stays true to its source material because, 
well, a bunch of the items from Skyrim have been brought directly into the game. From a potion of minor healing or some leather armour to an amulet of Talos, a silver sword or even Wuthrad, the legendary axe reforged by Eol and Greymane at the Skyforge in Whiterun, there are loads of recognisable items on offer in Call to Arms. Indeed, the images on the item cards have been pulled directly from the game itself, making each one instantly familiar. These items behave roughly as you'd expect, with the Silver Sword giving you bonus damage against certain enemy types, for example, while the Potion of Minor Healing will restore the odd hit point or two. It's fairly obvious fan service, of course. Indeed, it's hard to imagine this game not having recognisable items from the Elder Scrolls Skyrim, but it's a pleasing bit of fan service all the same, and it helps make Call to Arms feel grounded in the Elder Scrolls as most people would recognise it. Of course, as much as The Elder Scrolls is about items and the murdering of their owners for the purposes of acquisition, it's in the quest lines that the beating heart of the enormous video game franchise truly lies. So it is that Call to Arms takes a similar structure, with the game's delve mode offering up linked scenarios in order to form a quest line. As I mentioned in my video earlier this week, for instance, the scenario I played was the middle third of the Bleak Falls Barrow quest to retrieve the Golden Claw. One of the most memorable starting quests from Skyrim, as hopefully you'll remember. This scenario involved dashing about some ruins, battling marauding Draugr and prizing open treasure chests in search of the Golden Claw before heading for the puzzle door and escaping. And you know what? It wasn't the most groundbreaking scenario, but it was quite exciting to play through a recognisable quest from Skyrim all the same. It's worth noting this isn't the only quest format the game has to offer, either. While the scenarios are obviously the headline quests, there are also quest cards you draw and complete for extra victory points along the way. A quest might require you to defeat three enemy models, for example. Not exactly difficult to do, but then again, you might be trying to sneak your way through the entire scenario, avoiding combat altogether. Either way, I didn't see too many of the side quests on offer, but they're still handy in that they offer up additional victory points and can influence your playstyle a bit, should you decide to chase after them. It's worth noting, too, that some of these side quests are linked, as denoted by a special icon on the relevant cards. Once you've completed the first objective, you add the next objective card to the quest deck, thereby advancing your journey and opening up new avenues for you to explore, mimicking the multi-part side quests in Skyrim that you could steadily chip away at while exploring the wilderness. The third and final layer of questy goodness, meanwhile, comes in the form of vows. At the start of my time with Call to Arms Delve Mode, I had a choice of three possible vows, basically added objectives. For one victory point, I could try and open a treasure chest while hidden. For two victory points, I could try and grab the Golden Claw and escape before the end of turn five. And for three victory points, I could attempt to open every single treasure chest. It seemed rude to start a demo by basically saying, yeah, I'm going to try and get this over with as quickly as humanly possible, and searching every treasure chest frankly felt like a lot of work, so I opted for the sneaky, or rather, the cowardly approach. The reward wasn't exactly astronomical, but then again it wasn't especially difficult to complete this objective, and it did influence the way my game played out in the early stages, and that was quite fun. Next on the list of ways in which Elder Scrolls Call to Arms stays true to Skyrim is in the inclusion of magic. The Dragonborn in my demo was flanked by an Imperial Sword Mage, equipped with both the Flame and Firebolt spells. True to their counterparts in the game, these had different ranges, casting difficulties and damage profiles. Firebolt was harder to cast and couldn't be used at melee range, for example, whereas Flames, while less powerful, was nonetheless much more versatile. Again, this isn't a huge surprise as, like the items, these are pretty much straight ports from the video game, but picking which one to use in each scenario as a magic user again feels very familiar. Hot swapping between different spells is as much a part of the core Skyrim combat experience as managing your stamina and magicka, and also, let's face it, it's fun to blast things in the face with fire. It's also fun to blast things in the face by shouting at them, and funnily enough, that's another way Call to Arms stays true to its source material. 
On top of Magicka, Health and Stamina, the Dragonborn has a Thum Tracker. Points of Thum are used to power Dragon Shouts, with each point of Thum sufficient to power one word apiece. So if you're in the mood to yell at your adversaries, you can commit as many points as you need to do the damage, pushback or whatever other effect you desire at the time. Although, let's face it, if you've got the chance to yell Fus Rodar, why would you ever stop at Fus? Very finally, and let's face it, most obviously, the seventh way Elder Scrolls Call to Arms stays true to the video game is in the miniatures, because they're bloody lovely. And they have recognisable characters. Four! Anyway, I've banged on about them enough already on the channel, so you know what? That'll about do it. Those were seven ways Elder Scrolls Call to Arms stays true to Skyrim. What do you think? Do you like the look, or is it not quite your cup of tea? Your thoughts would be very welcome in the comments below. Hopefully you found this video interesting. If you did, there are loads more from Dicebreaker for you to watch. Some of them should be on screen now, so do give one of those a click. Do like, subscribe, and ring the bell icon so you don't miss anything else from Dicebreaker, but most importantly, thank you very much for watching, and have a lovely day.